Good morning, everybody. It's Saturday, and it's Russ Barkley back again with your weekly research update and another episode of Boomers Wearing Flannel. Hey, got another dad joke for you. Why can't you hear a pterodactyl in the bathroom? Wait, wait, wait for it. Because the P is silent. Oh, that's so good. I love that joke. All right, let's continue with this morning's research roundup. Uh, for those of you who are new to my weekly research updates, I put all of the research that was published this week over in the thumbnail sketch associated with this video. Then I select those I think are noteworthy and give some brief comments about each of those papers. For those papers I discuss in the video, I also give you the link over to the journal article if you wish to pursue it. Keep in mind, I do not review research on animals, and I also do not review research in dissertations or master's theses that may have been published on the internet, but none of which has undergone, as yet, peer review for journal publication. So we stick just with peer-reviewed articles. Okay, so first up this week is this article that you see here. Let me just widen my screen. Uh, on the long-term cardiovascular risks that may be associated with stimulant treatment for attention deficit disorder. This is, of course, a, a rather hot button or controversial area because from time to time I hear uh, lay people and the mainstream media talking about um, whether there's a risk for a heart attack or stroke in people who take stimulant medication over a long term. Uh, and of course, we've had articles on this going all the way back for the last 40 years. But lately, we've seen a number of research papers that are large databases, and so we do need to pay attention to those. So here is a study that was published in the European Heart Journal. It comes from Denmark, uh, and it uses the country's large-scale database of their health records to take a look at the possible cardiovascular risks that are associated with treatment with uh, stimulant medication. Uh, and in this review, it also included atomoxetine, although that's not necessarily a stimulant. Uh, it is associated with what is called um, management of sympathomimetic amines, types of neurochemicals in the brain. So they're looking specifically for any increase in heart failure, uh, in stroke, and in what is called acute coronary syndrome. So they're going to use this country's database, and they identified 27,724 people uh, that had been started on medication, and they then divided them into those who stopped medication, those who were on a low dose of medication, and those who were on a higher dose of medication. And they compared the three groups for their risk of these cardiac problems over the next 10 years, so known as a 10-year absolute risk ratio here that they're calculating. What they found is that the high-dose group, compared to both the discontinuation and the low-dose group, did have a slightly higher risk of heart attack, that is, of sudden cardiac arrest, and of stroke. Uh, the risks were increased by about 30% over what we would see in the typical population. Uh, so that may sound large to you, but remember, we're, it's not that you have a 30% chance of these happening, it's that your risk increases 30% over the baseline. So one thing I want you to keep in mind here then is, what was the baseline? Well, the baseline for heart attack and stroke in a population of this young age, keep in mind that these people were 23 to 41 years of age, is very, very low. And so, for instance, if, let's say, uh, out of thin air, six people in the general population carried a risk for these problems, then a third of that would be eight people treated with high-dose medication would have an elevated risk. So uh, again, an increase of just two people in the population. Nothing that you would get excited about, even though that's a 30% rise in the risk ratio. So we need to pay attention to absolute numbers when we look at relative risk, because if the absolute numbers are very low, it doesn't take many new cases of that event to raise the risk ratio. And that's probably what is happening 
in a study like this. Also keep in mind, because the study uses such a large sample of people, even slight changes in risk ratios can become statistically significant, even though clinically they're not all that interesting. So I don't want to minimize the findings completely here because there might be some signal here that over 10 years there is a little bit of elevated risk of heart attack and stroke in people taking these medications. But let's remember this is one country, not a representative sample of the world, though it's a very large study. The second thing to keep in mind is there's a possible confounding factor here that the authors don't mention in the abstract for this article, and that is severity of ADHD. It's very likely that people with ADHD who discontinued treatment were milder cases who weren't seeing much benefit from medication or in some other way were different from the rest of the group. People with a low dose of medication may have had somewhat more ADHD, and people on the highest dose of medication may have had more severe ADHD. So there's no effort in this study to control for severity of ADHD that might be associated with higher doses of medication. Makes perfect sense that there would be such an association. Uh, so until that gets corrected for in a study like this, I'm not going to take this study to the bank and say, oh, definitively, there's an elevated risk for these two cardiac outcomes, because we just don't know that. It's a very unusual design in this study that they broke it down this way. Uh, so keep those two things in mind. Uh, what is the base rate for the event? Is it low? Well, then a rise over that base rate can seem impressive when it isn't. Second, there's a confounding here. Severity of ADHD was not controlled for in the study. And by the way, that's not just something to be uh, or, or hypothetical. Uh, we know that ADHD links up with coronary risk by itself, independent of being treated with ADHD or being treated for ADHD with these drugs. ADHD alone creates an elevated risk for future coronary heart disease, as we found in my longitudinal study, as I discuss in my video on this channel on health outcomes, and as we found in other research that showed a reduced life expectancy if ADHD is not treated. And one of the risks for that life expectancy was problems with coronary heart disease. So for various reasons, people with ADHD carry an elevated risk because they smoke more, they drink more, they don't exercise as much, they eat a very high carb, fast food, Western diet, and all of these other factors that elevate risk for coronary heart disease. So just a cautionary remark there about don't take this study too seriously. Here's another reason not to take this too, study too seriously. A year ago, over in the journal JAMA Network dealing with psychiatry, there was a meta-analysis of all research in the world on cardiovascular risk associated with ADHD medications. And you know how I love meta-analyses because they take all of the studies and examine all of their data grouped together. So here's a meta-analysis from a year ago that looked at 19 studies involving over 3.9 million people around the world from six different countries and regions all collapsed into a meta-analysis. And what did they find as far as future risk for coronary or, or cardiac arrest, stroke, arrhythmias, and so on? Nothing. They found no effect of stimulant medication on increasing any of these risks. So there you have it. This is a much bigger study, a much better study, because it's a meta-analysis that involves lots of studies combined together, and it doesn't see a signal. And that tells me that there's something very peculiar about the Danish study I just discussed that was published this week that might have a confounding factor associated with it. I think that might be severity of ADHD. Okay, so we've beaten that dead horse enough. Let's move on and talk about another interesting study that I uh, enjoyed reading about. This is a study that looks at family functioning in children with ADHD, both clinically diagnosed and children whose ADHD was elevated but didn't quite meet all the diagnostic criteria for the disorder. So they call them subthreshold ADHD, and they compared both of these groups 
to a control group. The numbers are pretty good here. You've got 179 kids with ADHD. You've got another 86 with subthreshold ADHD, and we've got 212 control kids. They took a variety of measures of family functioning, uh, and these included things like parenting sense of efficacy, uh, parenting consistency, parent reported stress and life events in the family, family quality of life, partner-to-partner -partner communication within the family, and so on. What the study found uh, is that families of both clinical ADHD and subthreshold ADHD had similar rates of problems with family functioning. The parents had less sense of efficacy, less sense of parenting competence in their parental role, reported more stressful life events, uh, also reported poorer quality of life, uh, and greater parenting anger. More importantly, they followed these families for a period of several years, uh, and at the three-year outcome, found that all of those measures got worse over time. And also, parent-to-parent -parent communication was deteriorating over time. So in families in which ADHD is not being treated, we are finding that both ADHD and subthreshold ADHD cases are having significant problems within the family, with family functioning, and that these difficulties may be getting worse over time. All the more reason to intervene early with ADHD children and their families to get control of the disorder, to identify other family problems, to get the parents treated if they have adult ADHD or related disorder, which we know that a substantial minority of them do, so that we can manage these downstream adverse effects on family functioning. This isn't the first study to find these results, but I picked it because it's a longitudinal study uh, and most of the other studies are not, and it shows that these things are getting worse when treatment isn't being directed toward the family. So a very important study there that was uh, published in, let's see, where was this published? Over in the University of Exeter at their Open Research Center. Uh, so you can have a look at that as well. And then let's move on to a third paper. This is one of the initial and I think well done studies on probiotics as a supplement to medication treatment of ADHD in children. Now, what's the background here? We know that there's a promising area of research for both ADHD and autism spectrum on the gut microbiome and gut health, and that there appears to be a relationship between gut health and brain functioning. And within ADHD, and especially within the autism spectrum, there are emerging findings showing that there is abnormal gut health in these individuals, and that there is some relationship between that and exacerbation of their symptoms. Nobody is claiming that gut health alone is the cause of ADHD or autism. What we're saying is that for various reasons, people with those neurodevelopmental disorders may have abnormal gut health that could be making their symptoms somewhat worse. So that's the background here. Uh, and this study went in and decided to supplement medication treatment with probiotics and found that after three months of treatment, that the group that got medication with probiotics had an improvement in their ADHD symptoms and in measures of their executive functioning through psychological tests compared to the group that got medication only. So clearly this suggests that adding this probiotic supplement to the medication treatment may have been beneficial. The authors are very conservative in saying, hey, this is just a pilot study here. We need more research to see if we can replicate this finding. But a good sized study seemed to be well done, good measurement showing that probiotics might benefit ADHD kids as a supplement to their medication. By the way, the medication used in this study was atomoxetine, the non-stimulant, uh, but the study has nothing to say about whether that's better than a stimulant or something. It didn't compare medications here. We know that atomoxetine is an effective ADHD treatment, equivalent in its benefits to that of methylphenidate. 
not quite as powerful as the amphetamines, of course. Uh, so uh, a very interesting study that I thought was worth a look at. It was published over in BMC Psychiatry. Okay, we're going to wrap it up with our last study here that was published over in the journal Dermatology. This is looking once again at the relationship of a autoimmune disorder, in this case, a topic dermatitis, and its linkage with ADHD and autism spectrum. Now, you should know that there are many other earlier studies, single studies, that have identified such an association. That is, that kids with atopic dermatitis had slightly elevated risk for these disorders, but kids with those disorders had a much greater increase in risk for atopic dermatitis. So now, why am I focusing on this particular study? It's a meta-analysis. It's a systematic review that identified 24 studies involving 71 million patients, all collapsed together for an analysis. What did they find? They found that AD, atopic dermatitis, had about a 30% increase in risk of occurrence in people with ADHD, had about a 90% increase in risk in kids who were on the autism spectrum, uh, and they then reversed it and looked at, okay, if you had atopic dermatitis, what was your risk of having those two disorders? Slightly higher than the population prevalence, but not much. In other words, kids with, a or kids with atopic dermatitis, let's get this right, kids with AD, about 6.6% of them had ADHD. That's very near the population prevalence. And again, kids with AD had about a 1.6 occurrence percent occurrence of autism. Again, right around population prevalence. So what is this saying? It's saying that there's kind of a one-way comorbidity here. If you have atopic dermatitis, you're only slightly more likely to have one of these two neurodevelopmental disorders, but let's reverse that. If you have one of those two disorders, you do carry a significantly elevated risk of having atopic dermatitis. So what the authors are saying is if you work in dermatology and you're seeing kids with AD, you might want to screen them or refer them for further evaluation of potential ADHD or ASD, particularly if parents are complaining about symptoms of those. Vice versa, if you're seeing kids in clinics that have either of these neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, you might want to pay attention to par parent reports about whether the kids have atopic dermatitis and maybe refer to a dermatologist. Okay, well, that's a lot longer than we had planned for this morning, but I thought these were very important research papers published this week to talk about. Join me next Saturday for another research review of whatever research is published. By the way, we're seeing about 20 to 25 articles a week being published on ADHD. What does that translate to? About a thousand articles a year appearing in research journals that deal with ADHD. So a very uh, robust, a very vibrant research community going on out there studying uh, ADHD uh, and its various adverse events, treatments, and so on. So uh, a lot to keep up with out there. So I hope you'll stay tuned next week for my research review. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. If you like our content, as I always suggest, kindly recommend my channel to others. I really appreciate that. And I look forward to seeing you again for another research review next week. Be well, everybody.